Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in today's video tutorial we're going to be using computational fluid dynamics, also just referred to as CFD, in order to evaluate the flow through an orifice meter. Now an orifice meter is basically just a plate with a hole in and the way that the orifice meter is used is to determine velocities and flow rates through a tube. Now, if we know various parameters, such as the pressure drop across the orifice plate, then we can determine the velocity of the fluid, and hence the volume and mass flow rate. So, just to explain what we have on the screen here, here we have a drawing, but this isn't of the tube and the orifice plate in itself. In actual fact, what this drawing is of is the volume contained within the tube. So, in order to carry out a computational fluid dynamics analysis, we need to evaluate the volume of fluid. So if you can imagine, we have a pipe and within that pipe we have a fluid. We also have a solid metal disc or a solid metal plate with a hole in the center. So what we have is we have the fluid volume and the fluid's gonna be traveling from left to right and then we meet the orifice plate here. Well, as mentioned before, the orifice plate is just a plate with a hole in the center. And what we can see is that a hole has a chamfer. We have various different views on here, but what we can see in the top center is our exploded view, or detail view B here. Fluids traveling left to right. Where the material has been removed here represents our orifice plate. Remember that we're evaluating the volume of fluid, not the pipe and the orifice plate itself. So we have to remove material where the plate would exist. So the fluid travels through, it reaches the orifice, then the diameter of the fluid narrows and we have a chamfer before the fluid exits the orifice. Now what we're going to be doing is measuring the pressure drop across that orifice plate. So the first step to doing this is to create the volume or create the geometry in Fusion. Once we have that volume, we can export that to Autodesk CFD and we can begin to evaluate the pressures and velocities within this system. So let's go over to Fusion now and create the volume noting that our orifice plate has a thickness of four millimeters. It has a 45 degree chamfer, and we have a thousand millimeters or a meter of fluid upstream of the orifice, and we have a thousand millimeters or one meter downstream of the orifice. The total length therefore is 2004 millimeters or two meters plus the additional four millimeters for the thickness of the orifice. The diameter of our pipe is 102 millimeters, and the diameter of our orifice up here in the top left exploded view is 50 millimeters with our 45 degree chamfer on the leading edge of the orifice plate. Okay, so here we are in Fusion and I'm going to begin by creating a sketch. And this sketch is going to be a circle of diameter 102 millimeters to represent the outside diameter of our volume of fluid which would basically be our inside pipe diameter if we were modeling the solid itself. So I have 102 millimeters. And now I can exit my sketch. Now, if you recall, the total length of our fluid volume was 2004 millimeters. So I'm going to extrude this. Two thousand and four, and that gives us the general shape of our fluid traveling through the tube. Remember that this is the volume of fluid that we're producing a model for here. Next, I need to create my orifice, and the way that I'm going to do this again is using an extrude function, and I'm going to draw on the end face of my cylinder here. So, create a sketch, select my face. And this time I need to create a circle of diameter 50 millimeters to represent the hole in the orifice plate. Okay, so now I'm going to create my extrusion and this is the extrusion to remove the material that represents the orifice plate. So I'm going to create an extrude and I'm going to select the outside area here. Now the important thing to note is I'm not selecting the hole because I want to remove the material from the fluid volume that represents the orifice plate. I'm not creating the hole itself. We're going to have fluid occupying the hole, but we're not going to have fluid occupying the volume of the orifice plate. And I don't want to create my cut for the plate on this front surface here. I want to create it in the center of my pipe. So instead of starting at the profile plane, which is the front face, 
I'm going to change that to offset plane. Because this is our negative direction, we can see this changing to minus 491. I want my offset plane to be positioned at minus 1000 millimeters. So here in offset, minus 1000. And now I can see where that cut's going to begin. I want this cut to be four millimeters. Again, we can see that the arrow is indicating our negative direction. So I'm going to change that to minus four. Now I can either put my taper on now or I can do it as a chamfer afterwards. And I'm going to do it as a chamfer afterwards just to help me to visualize what's happening here. So first of all, I'm going to create my cup. And what you'll be able to see now is that that piece of material has been removed. It's no longer present. So what I have at the moment here is a square orifice for my fluid to flow through. But I need to add my chamfer. So I'm going to switch to a line view by going to display settings, visual style, wireframe. And I'm going to create a chamfer. So if I go to modify, chamfer, and select the inside edge, effectively this is going to be the exit of the orifice, equal distance, and we know that that is four millimeters. Okay. So now what we can see is that we have our fluid flowing left to right. It travels through the 50 millimeter diameter orifice, and then we have an outward taper as it flows into the second section of the pipe. So we have everything we need for our geometry now. I'm going to save this. And I've already created a location here, CFD exports. And I'm going to save this as 102-50 for the two diameters of our pipe, MM orifice. I'm going to copy that name as well because I'm going to use that for my export file. So save. Okay, the next thing that I need to do is to create a component from the bodies that I have on the screen here. So if I go to bodies and I only have one body here to select, I can right click on that and select create components from bodies. I need to create a component from the body before I can export this body. So create components from bodies and now we see we have our component listed on the left hand side here. Finally, to get this from Fusion and into CFD, I'm going to right click. Now we have an export option and I'm going to export this geometry with the same name, 102-50 millimeter orifice, and I'm going to export it as a SAP file. There's various different file options here, but if we export as a SAP file, we can then import that into Autodesk CFD. At the moment, we can see that that export is going to my downloads folder, which is absolutely fine for the time being, but you can specify where you want that saved so that you can retrieve it when you enter Autodesk CFD. Okay, so that's us finished in Fusion. Now we're going to go over to Autodesk CFD. And we're going to import our geometry so that we can carry out our analysis. So the first thing that we're going to do then is create a new project. We need to browse and locate that SAP file that we just created. So browse, downloads, and there's my file. I need to name my design study. Again, I'm going to use the same name, 102-50 millimeter orifice, and then click create. And what we'll see now is the geometry that we just created in Fusion is going to be imported into Autodesk CFD. Okay, so there's our geometry. Now, first of all, the layout of the tools is a little bit different in Autodesk CFD, but we do have the same functions that we had before. If we go up to view, first of all, you'll notice that we have the same buttons for moving our geometry. We have pan, we have zoom, and we have orbit. So let's bring this in a little bit closer. Okay, now in order to set this up for our simulation, in the top left hand ribbon, we have various different tabs. And the one that we need to be working with is setup. In fact, the main ones that we're going to be using here is setup, view when we want to move our object around the page, and then finally, when we come to analyze the results, we're going to use the results tab. But before we can begin, we need to set up our geometry for the simulation. So we go to setup, and again, we have various different links or tabs along the top here. 
We're basically going to run through these in sequence. Geometry tools is if we want to tidy up or clean our geometry, so we're going to ignore that one for the time being. So moving along next, we have materials. We need to specify the material of our fluid region. So we click on our fluid region, and you notice a little edit icon appears alongside the object. So we select edit, we're going to set our fluid as water. Like so, and then we're going to apply. We can see in the bottom left hand corner that we've specified our fluid as water. Moving on next then, we have our boundary conditions. And we need to specify a boundary condition at either end of this pipe. We're going to have an inlet velocity of 0.95 meters per second. So I click on my end face here, edit. Velocity is specified. And scrolling down, I can input my magnitude as 0.95. And hit enter or apply, and that's been applied to that surface. Now again, we can see down here in the bottom left, we have the velocity specified as our variable. Now I'm going to switch to view again just so we can zoom in. Okay, so what we notice on this surface now is a black band appears and that black band corresponds with the colour alongside our velocity label here. So we know that we've specified the velocity at inlet. The other thing that we're going to specify is an outlet pressure of one bar or 100,000 pascals. So if we click home to reset our object, we need to orbit because we're going to be applying a boundary to the other end of the pipe. Again, switching to setup. We select the face. This time we edit and we're going for pressure. And our pressure magnitude is going to be 100,000 pascals. Again, we can click apply or hit enter. We see a new band appear on that face. So view, zoom, and we see that band corresponds with the color alongside pressure in the bottom left hand corner. Okay, the last thing that we need to do is specify a mesh. Now, the purpose of this activity is to look at various different meshes and see how the results are affected. So what we're going to do is start with a coarse mesh and we're gradually going to refine that mesh, decreasing the element size, and look at what impact that has on the results. So again, if we go to setup, moving left to right, we can ignore initial conditions because we're doing a steady state analysis. And the next icon we come to is mesh sizing. So we click on mesh sizing. We click on our volume. And our first mesh that we're going to use is an automatic auto-sized mesh. So here we see a lightning flash for auto-size, and it says define the mesh automatically. There is also an icon in the ribbon at the top. So if we click on auto-size, and what we'll see is that various nodes have been applied to our object. We can see them on each of the edges here. If we want to find out a bit more about that mesh, such as how many elements are included, once again, we can go to Setup. We can click on Edit Mesh. And we'll see in the pane that appears that our geometry has approximately 14,000 mesh elements. And we're going to refine this mesh later on in this tutorial. But for now, we can cancel to keep the mesh that we've got. And now we can solve our simulation. I'm going to set this away. And here I'm going to specify that I'm doing a steady state analysis and we're going to run 100 iterations or 100 sets of calculations basically and hit solve. So in the output bar at the bottom there's going to be various messages. First of all it's going to tell us that it's meshing our geometry and then we're going to see the process of the iterations as they progress. So now we can see various different parameters getting calculated, such as velocities, pressures and temperatures throughout our iterations. We're going to be carrying out 100 iterations, so we'll return at the end of the iteration process. 
Okay, so now our simulations are complete. I'm just going to minimize the output bar at the bottom to give us a little bit more space. Going to resize my view. Now we can begin to look at our results. The first thing that we notice is that we're unable to see what's happening within the pipe, but what we do see is that we've got velocity variations throughout our pipe. At the moment, these are in centimeters per second, but if I right click on that and select units, I can switch that to meters per second. So we have velocities ranging from zero, and in actual fact, it will be zero on the outside of the tube or the outside of the fluid volume, ranging all the way to 3.8. So although we specified our inlet velocity is 0.95 meters per second, as the fluid travels through the orifice, we would expect the speed to reach around 3.8 meters per second. But how can we check that? Well, if we select the results tab and we select planes, we're going to create a view plane so we can see what's happening. If we click add, then the software is going to pick a logical view plane for us, which it's done there. So what we have is a cross-sectional cut through the centre of our pipe. So if we zoom in, what we can see is quite an interesting result because we can see what's happening throughout our pipe. We can see that the fluid travelling from left to right has the velocity that we specified of 0.95 metres per second. We see close to the wall the fluid velocity is zero, which is as we would expect due to viscous drag. And then as the fluid travels through the orifice, we see the velocity speed up or increase, and it takes a while for our flow profile to settle back down again. We can look at other parameters, and the parameter that we're going to focus on is pressures. So if we switch our view on our plane to pressure, or static pressure here, we get a new scale or bar appear on the left-hand side, and again, I'm going to switch the units to something more usable, Pascals. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the way that an orifice plate would normally work is we would look at the pressure either side of the orifice. Typically, that would be our maximum pressure on the left-hand side and our minimum pressure on the right-hand side. And what we're then able to do is work out the pressure drop across the orifice plate, and hence we can work out the velocities. Well, you'll recall that we specified the velocity at the start of the problem, and if our fluid's traveling from left to right at 0.95 meters per second, once the flow settles again, the velocity must be the same because the volume flowing into and out of the pipe is going to be the same. But what we can still do is analyze the pressure drop across this orifice. We know the maximum pressure before the orifice is 105.944, based on the scale on the left hand side here. And we know the minimum pressure to the right of the orifice is 97621. So the pressure drop is going to be the difference between those two pressures. Well, 105944 minus 97621 gives us a pressure drop of 8,323 pascals. So for comparison purposes, we have a mesh with 14,000 elements, and we have a calculated pressure drop of 8323 pascals. Now we're going to further refine this mesh, and we're going to rerun the simulation in exactly the same way. We don't need to re-specify our boundary conditions because they're going to remain unchanged, but what we do need to do is reallocate our mesh. So if we go to Setup, Mesh Sizing, we click on our geometry and go to edit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to halve the average element size. So here under size adjustment, we have a value of one, giving us 14,000 elements. I'm going to change that to a half, 0 0.5. I'm going to hit enter. And we see now that we're going to have 17,000 elements. It's not a huge change in the number, but we have redefined that mesh slightly. I'm going to apply the changes like so. And now I'm going to rerun the simulation to see how the results are affected. Rather than continue from the 100th iteration, I'm going to set that back to zero, which is going to copy over our old data. And once again, we'll return once the simulation is completed. 
Okay, so our second simulation there took perhaps five minutes to run. But what we do notice is that our results have changed somewhat. First of all, if we look at our velocities, switching our units again to meters per second, we see that this time our maximum velocity has increased to 4.5 meters per second through the orifice. The results displayed on the plane here are still our pressures, and once again we're interested in the drop in pressure across that orifice, which can be found from the highest pressure before the orifice, minus the lowest pressure after the orifice. Let's switch this to Pascal's. We have 107.995 Pascal's before the orifice, and we have 97.481 Pascal's after the orifice. This time then, the pressure drop across that orifice is actually 10,514 pascals. So we've seen a reasonable increase than from the previous set of simulations where that value was around 8,300. Now I'm going to run one more simulation and what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to refine the mesh even further but I'm going to refine the mesh in the region of the orifice here. We're less interested in what's happening upstream and downstream, but what we do need is accurate calculations or accurate approximations around this orifice. Let's move this in a little bit closer. And this time, I'm going to apply a mesh to a surface rather than to a volume. So as we look here, this is our orifice in outline form, and we're going to apply a mesh to this chamfered surface of the orifice. Now if we define a tight mesh or a refined mesh here, then that's going to propagate either side of the orifice. If we have very small mesh elements on this surface, then naturally we're going to get more mesh elements than we had in the previous simulation. We can't just jump from small elements up to large elements, there's going to be a graduation as we move away from the orifice. So in setup, mesh sizing, instead of specifying a volume mesh, I'm going to keep the existing volume mesh, which we can see from the nodes on our diagram here, but I'm also going to specify a surface mesh. Now I want to pick the surface that has the chamfer on it, and you'll notice at the moment I can't select it. If this object was solid, I wouldn't be able to see that surface, so I need to rotate it until I can see that surface. So again, orbiting, if I pull this round, now I can see that surface between the two gaps. It's a little difficult to visualise, but I'm looking at that chamfered surface. Mesh surface. And you'll notice now that the two edges of that chamfer can be highlighted. Edit. OK. Now I'm going to set this much lower this time. I'm going to set this as 0.02, which is a 2% mesh. If I hit enter, we can see that it's applied a lot of nodes on that surface, and now we have 270,000 mesh elements. Now this may be a little bit excessive, so I'm going to reduce this to 0.05, or a 5% mesh, and apply my mesh. Okay, so now I'm going to rerun the analysis with the denser or finer mesh at the orifice here. Let's zoom out slightly. Go to Setup, Solve, start at zero, and click Solve. Now we're going to expect this simulation to take quite a lot longer in order to run. So once again, I'm going to leave this running and we'll return to the video once this simulation has been completed. So here we have the results from the third simulation. And once again, we can see the velocity value, switching the units, has increased to 6.1 meters per second. So that's considerably higher than before, before we had 4.5 meters per second. But what we're doing here is we're improving the accuracy by increasing the mesh density. In relation to our pressures then, again switching to Pascal's, we have a maximum pressure of 113603 and we have a minimum pressure of 95354. Subtracting our minimum pressure from our maximum pressure this time gives us a pressure difference 
of 18,249 pascals. Now once again, this is significantly higher than previously, where we calculated the pressure difference to be around 10,500 pascals. So we've seen an increase in the pressure drop across the orifice by refining the mesh, and we've also seen an increase in the maximum velocity of the fluid traveling through the orifice. If we were to continue to refine this mesh, eventually what we would see is that these results would begin to taper off. So there we would get to the situation where further refinement of the mesh wouldn't necessarily give us much more accurate results. It's a bit of a payoff really between computation time and accuracy of results. Now, the important question really is, are we approaching accurate results here? Is a pressure drop of 18.2 kilopascals or 18,200 pascals what we would expect for an orifice of this size? Now, there is actually a calculation that we can do to check this. And we're going to take a look at that calculation now just to try to validate the results that we've got here. So the formula that can be used to calculate the pressure drop across an orifice of this type is displayed in the top left hand corner. The change in pressure or the pressure drop equals a half times rho, where rho is the density, DO value, well DO is the diameter of the orifice and D1 is the diameter of the pipe, DO over D1 to the power 4. And then in a separate set of brackets we have the initial velocity upstream U1 which was the velocity we specified entering the pipe, times A1, all divided by a coefficient of discharge times the area of the orifice. And that bracket there is all squared. So we know that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. We know that the diameter of our orifice was 50 millimeters, or 0 0.05 meters. And the diameter of our pipe was 102 millimetres, or 0 0.102 metres. We can calculate the area of our orifice and the area of our pipe using pi r squared. So the value that we would get for the area of our orifice equals 1.9635 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. And the area we get for our pipe is 8.1713 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. We specified a pipe entry velocity of 0.95 meters per second. And a typical coefficient of discharge for a sharp edged orifice is 0 0.6. When we plug all of these values into the formula at the top, we get a pressure drop delta P in Pascals equal to 20,000 455 pascals. So we would expect the pressure drop from our CFD simulations to be around 20,000 pascals or 20 kilopascals. And our most refined mesh there returned a value of 18.2 kilopascals or 18,200 pascals. So we're in the right order of magnitude. Now recall that we could further refine our mesh and by further refining our mesh, we would get a more accurate result, the consequence of which is that the computation time would increase. So as we've said previously, it's a balance between computation time and accuracy of results. So the mesh refinement and optimization process is designed to find a mesh that yields relatively accurate results, but in an acceptable computation time.